So yeah, I'll just jump straight in and then um, we can talk about everything. So a bit of context, I'm, um, I, I, I work in the art and technology space. I had my own company called Vastari for 10 years. It was a matchmaking service, not on the blockchain, but a cloud-based networking service for uh, people who owned art and museums for exhibition loans. So when a museum was planning an exhibition, they could borrow a piece from a private collection or from an artist. And um, we also started touring exhibitions around the world, etc. So some of this talk is based on my findings doing that job. But while I was doing that job, I also happened to help organize um, an event at Christie's that you can find on YouTube. It was called the Art and Tech Summit Exploring Blockchain. It was in 2018, um, before NFTs was even a term. And we talked about art on the blockchain instead of NFTs. And it was talking about whether the art world is ready for consensus. Um, when I heard about blockchain in 2015, I thought, wow, this is ideal for the art world because I had seen firsthand how everyone has their information in silos and we keep having people re-importing information and wouldn't it be great if there was some kind of a central source of truth? Um, since then, blockchain has evolved into many different directions, um, but that gives you a little bit of context of where I come from. And uh, if you're interested in that talk, it's about seven hours long because there's all these panel discussions, but it includes the guys from CryptoPunks and Masha from Ascribe and Jason, uh, Art Gnome, uh, and a lot of other people from this space. So it's quite a fun thing to Google if you want to. And um, so I uh, now, uh, since, since uh, last year, I've been working on a company called Arquil. Um, we started, well, actually, it was, um, I'm, I'm no longer the CEO and founder. I'm actually the hired CEO of this company, which is a company that was incubated by um, Boston Consulting Group on behalf of MCH, which is the parent company of Art Basel, and the Luma Foundation, which is Maya Hoffman, who's this big philanthropist, uh, art collector, yeah. her nonprofit. And so these three entities, BCG, MCH, and Luma, have come together to build a blockchain built by the art world for the art world, kind of taking some of the learnings from what happened in the NFT space by reusing the Ethereum blockchain for art, but uh, focusing on physical artworks and how to track them throughout their lifetime. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit more if you're interested. But um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll jump straight through to the next slide, giving you a bit of um, I, I, it, I, I feel it always gives a little bit of uh, context to know why I called my first company Vastari, which is basically Giorgio Vasari with a T for technology. And Giorgio Vasari, um, I don't know how many of you already know of him or have heard of him. Uh, he was a friend of all of the. Um, all of the Ninja Turtles, uh, so Donatello, Michelangelo, Leonardo, and um, all of these guys from uh, and Raphael from the Renaissance. He was also a painter himself, but he wrote a book that actually changed things. It was in Italian, not Latin, and it was called The Lives of the Artists. And as a result of that book, um, people not only learned about art, but learned about the kind of the additional context around that art so all of the information about it in terms of like michelangelo is a diva and um Raphael died in the throes of passion with the baker's daughter so some people don't call him an art historian and call him a gossip but what i like to say is that because of his book we still talk about those artists today and renaissance artists are um achieving amazing prices and are considered like really important. And I really believe that it's also thanks to Vasari and the fact that he wrote this in a way that was very accessible and that people understood and appreciated um, that, 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 that those artists lived and still are relevant 500 years later. Um, so you have, of course, the most expensive artwork ever bought at auction by Leonardo da Vinci or attrib attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. Um, you've got uh, a, a, a huge uh, work uh, by Botticelli that got huge um, coverage because it was the most expensive work at 
uh, Freeze Masters uh, just uh, two years ago, and um, and and of course uh, a, a Raphael drawing sold for forty seven million. So like, it's still, uh, of course, prices don't equate relevance, but it shows that these are, things are very valued even today. And I think of exhibitions as kind of that context, uh, and that's why I set up Vastari that uh, twelve years ago. Um, Exhibitions are that context in the vernacular. The vernacular now is not Italian. It's just having the art out of warehouses and in the real world and having context around it. And um, while I was running Vastari, we, we started off doing mainly exhibitions that look like the middle of this slide, which is like paintings on walls with some context on a wall panel, etc. But increasingly, the exhibitions we were touring around the world to different museums had these kind of multimedia elements. So you had interactive displays like the ones on the right. This is from an exhibition about Archimedes. You have um, the, the the image on the left is actually a work by uh, a collective called Marshmallow Laser Feast. I don't know if any of you know them. It's uh, the, the work itself is called We Live in an Ocean of Air. And it's a virtual reality piece that ha that you can see your breath. You can smell sycamore trees and you're immersed in this virtual reality with six other people and it tells you about um oxygen and carbon dioxide and how we relate to nature and it's just extraordinary but that's an exhibition those um artists thought of it as an artwork even though it is ticketed and people go and visit it with six other people so it's really interesting because during that time that i was working at vasari i kind of discovered how much our art is changing because of technology and also how we experience it is changing because of technology. And these exhibitions and all of the context that is added around artworks is really what causes something to be perceived to be valuable, right? So there's the vitals, what the object is, who made it. There's the ownership and sales history, like this sold for 450 million at Christie's or whatever it might be. Um, but even like this was in the collection of the Gettys or this was in the collection of um, JP Morgan. Um, and then you have the exhibition history. So who showed this work and who added more context? Who, where was it seen next to what, et cetera? And then all of those things kind of magically come together to decide where what the value is of this artwork. And while I was working on this uh, on this company for 10 years, it also made me think a lot about what is the museum's role in that dialogue between the art that is displayed and the space where it's experienced? And, and, and how do you add that context, right? And what I was kind of alluding to in the previous slide is that we started off very much with paintings on walls or like sculptures in space. So it was physical stuff going to physical venues. Increasingly, so I ran Vastari from 2012 to 2022. Um, during that decade, you increasingly saw digital content going into physical spaces. So whether that was image mapping or virtual reality or um, kind of like screens or projections, you had digital content increasingly coming into that physical space. But what happened during COVID was that, interestingly, you started having digital space and people thinking of digital space as more of a three-dimensional thing rather than something you scroll through, um, which already has been happening for a long time, right, with virtual reality and augmented reality. But really during COVID, it became real that those connections, those that context that a museum is supposed to provide, that space for analyzing art that a museum is supposed to provide, started being digital. And what does that actually mean, right? Um, so some museums tackled that in different ways. Uh, the National Gallery, for example, started digitizing the physical artworks like for like and digitizing their physical spaces like for like. So kind of if you look at the evolution of what was going on, they were literally translating what was happening in physical to physical in the physical world. But that's happening in the physical world in that way because of physical constraints and replicating it in a digital space. So you still have a floor, you still have a ceiling, you even have little light fixtures that pretend to be a museum. 
you have labels, etc. The only kind of nice enhancement of this experience is that you can zoom in to a level that you never would be able to do in, in real life. And um, Moyosa Media that co-produced this with the National Gallery actually also has a museum called the Kramer Collection. That's a Rembrandt uh, collection where they have paintings. They, they maybe went a bit more conceptual because it wasn't a museum show. Uh, it was a private collection where you could actually have the paintings hanging in midair because because you're in virtual reality, you don't need a wall. And so you could look at the back of the paintings and you can really look at the whole thing as an object rather than how it has to be in a physical space because you physically have to hang it up. So those are the kinds of things that are kind of interesting when you think about digital to digital. So then you also have um, digital to physical in kind of a digital way, <laughs> which is where you have augmented reality. And this is a piece by Cause that was brought to outside the Tate Modern. So all of a sudden you have digital artworks going to physical locations outside of the places. So it's a geolocation. It's technically a digital space, but you see it through your digital camera on your phone. It starts getting a little bit abstract of what is the space, where is the art, what is the context? And then you also have some museums tackling this in a really interesting way where they were saying the digitized versions of our art. So sorry, just to give a bit of context, that cause work was co-produced with a company called Acute Art. that was working with contemporary artists like Cause, Jeff Coombs, uh, Olafur Eliasson to create digital artworks made for digital, right? So they're not digitizing anything. They're creating things from the ground up with artists who traditionally worked in physical media, but then created digital experiences with them. Um, but you also have museums that start to open source the digitized version of their physical objects. So the British Museum actually has a profile on Sketchfab and these 3D models of items in their collection are downloadable and you could actually do anything you want with them. You can remix them, you can rethink them, you can do, you can put them into any space you want to digitally and they're cool with that. So it starts like there's all these different ways of which how of how people were doing digital to digital and then what happened with the NFT phenomenon is that somehow there was this proposal that potentially this digital to digital is actually an NFT in a wallet, potentially. That, now, I'm, I'm, I'm putting that as a question mark because I think that what the space is where NFTs live is still a question. Um, but the way that NFTs are experienced still today is that you transact them and they go into your wallet. Then, of course, there's a website and you can access them and you can have an experience with them. But technically, that is the, 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 the equivalent of that object going into a museum. You've got a NFT going into a wallet. So that's a pretty interesting thing to think about. And I like to put this image at this point because um, I guess let me just go back to you guys. How many of you know this artwork? Uh, yeah, I see some thumbs up, some hearts. Okay, this is by an artist called Rene Magritte. Um, many people know it. It's, uh, oh my gosh, it's got a very long title, something about the treacherous nature of images, but I cannot remember exactly what it is. If someone wants to put it in the chat, that would be awesome. But it is actually in the museum in Los Angeles. And it says, this is not a pipe because it's not a pipe, it is a painting of a pipe. And this is what surrealists were very much thinking about this kind of object subject, kind of the relationship between the signifier and the signified and how we look at images, right? And, 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 and <laughs> then Magritte says they are treacherous, but what it means is that you, you, you can deceive and you can wonder what, what, what does this all mean? So, but let's be real here. This is not even a pipe. This is not, a painting of a pipe. This is a badly pixelated digital image on Google Slides of a pipe that is a pipe that is not a pipe. And so we start getting even further into treachery of images because it's not a pipe. It's not a painting of a pipe. It's a photograph of a painting of a pipe 
that is being shown to you on Discord through Google Slides. And uh, yeah, it's at a specific resolution based on when that image was taken. So, and you can't even really see the signature of Magritte in the bottom right hand corner. But what happens if I do this? What now? This is a pipe rep created multiple times. Would Magritte have been cool with this, of me showing uh, this image this way? Would Magritte have preferred this image versus this image? Because this one, I've made it so big that it started getting pixelated and it's actually not very nice. Or And this one actually might fit better with what he was trying to say, um, which is that this is not a pipe and it's actually a reproduction of a pipe. Uh, but this is a reproduction of a reproduction of a pipe. Um, so I, um, what I'm trying to say here is that we do not have Magritte's voice because he did not know that digital images were one day going to come our way and um, that people might want to take photographs of his artwork and say, this is a pipe of a pipe. pipe. Um, so we don't know what Magritte would have wanted us to do. And so during the time that uh yeah this all, will all make sense at one point to you all why i have this title here but basically during the time that covid was going on i was one of the few people that actually understood blockchain and so i got approached by a lot of museums that we were working with saying look at all these kids with money can you somehow help us that we're suffering uh with covid can you help us get some money from these kids we have lots of images can we sell them uh, what can we do? Because we are closed and maybe we can make something happen. And uh, I, I kind of, well, basically my answer was no, it's not that you can just mint your JPEGs and make this happen. But I'll give you a little bit of context about what was going on at that time and kind of why it didn't work specifically. So if we look at who was collecting NFTs at the beginning of the, uh, let's say, NFT boom of 2021, let's say, when when that people made it all really famous. It was all these um, non-museum audiences who were collecting NFTs, mainly people who understood from gaming why you would value digital assets, uh, younger people, people reading Reddit, technology enthusiasts, not really the type of person who spends their Sunday at the National Gallery. Um, maybe they do, but yes. Um, and then also there were very different approaches to digitization and NFTs out there. And uh, what I tried to explain is like, you can go for a super approachable uh, or rather accessible way of minting NFTs like CryptoKitties where you create a game and anyone can buy a CryptoKitty and, uh, or sorry, like, uh, what's it called? Um, Oh, I'm forgetting the word, breed a crypto kitty and start doing that. Or you can start being really like exclusive, like Pac. I don't know how many of you know Pac, but like he started getting really complicated with how he, um, how he, how you got access to his NFTs, right? Uh, he's a, he's a digital artist. You had to burn an NFT to get another NFT. You had to solve riddles and puddle, puzzles and all kinds of complicated stuff to get to actually getting an NFT. And there were all these different comparables at that time that were kind of coming about. So of course there were the CryptoPunks, which also existed when we did our event at Christie's, but back then, um, they were so affordable because they couldn't give them away. There were 10,000 of them. They were trying to uh, make sure that they got to a good home. Um, and at, at the time that I put together this slide, which was in 2021, they were going onto the secondary market for $760,000. And that was extraordinary. And now we're getting to the point where, uh, well, we got to a point where that was in the millions, right? Um, Original uh, originally, they were actually offered with a physical print signed by the artist because some people thought they wanted a, a physical print. Um, so really interesting what was going on with CryptoPunks at that time. Then you had NBA Top Shot, which was basically digitizing collectible um, cards, uh, like like the same thing that we all played with as kids, right? Where you bought a packet of cards and you got a whole bunch of them, except what you received were NFTs of um videos of shots and some of them were more valuable or less valuable depending on how rare and how cool the shot was um then you have um autoglyphs which a bit differently to 
most other um, NFTs were entirely on the blockchain. So the actual generative art was on the blockchain. This is pre, um, pre art box, pre FX hash, all that stuff. Um, and then you've got other approaches to the physical to digital, which was like Alexander McQueen, where they created RFID tags within their garments and you got an NFT when you bought an Alexander McQueen object so that you could um, prove that you bought that object and join an online community. So there's all these different comparables at that time of what was going on. And um, basically, yeah, I, I watched the whole thing unfold about how museums approach this. And the reason it's kind of relevant to you guys at the residency is because I think this question of the physical and the digital is essential to your artistic practice of thinking about how you see your work and what you want to define it as, which often is not defined within NFTs that are sold and your collectors will want to know. So anyway, let me go into a basically like a whirlwind uh, whistle stop tour of what happened with museums and NFTs. So in March 2021, around the same time as the people got that crazy price, an organization called the Global Art Museum on OpenSea um, took objects that were in the public domain, so images that were not that were copyright free and minted them as NFTs and tried to sell them on the Ethereum blockchain. Museum people got pretty pissed off. They said there's no, uh, the Global Art Museum claimed that a percentage of the sales would go to the museums that the artworks came from and that this was a new uh, disruptive thing. And museums were like, hold on, this is not what we want. Um, the reason our stuff is open is because it's not privatized. No one owns it. So if you start privatizing it and putting it in NFTs in people's wallets, then you're going against our open data policy, which is that things are copyright free and anyone can use it. Um, so it got a lot of headlines at that time. And then Global Art Museum tweeted that this was a an experiment and that they wanted to get people talking about NFTs and that that was what happened. Um, it was definitely interesting at the time, but um, maybe a little bit, uh, yeah, it demonstrated how problematic it is to just mint artworks on the blockchain because you really um, aren't, yeah, actually to give you a bit of context, no one bought those NFTs because the Global Art Museum didn't really have the authority to be selling these NFTs. And so no one really saw any value in owning them in the first place. So that was kind of interesting. There were some other people playing around with NFTs and uh, within museums uh, even before it was cool. Um, the National Museums of Liverpool, there was someone called uh, Frances, Frances Little who did a project called Crypto Connections, which was minting NFTs with these open source images from museum collections. But the metadata that was minted alongside the NFT was um, a personal connection with whoever was minting the NFT. So the museum visitor could add why they decided to mint that NFT with some added context about why they loved that piece from that museum or something like that. And those pieces, again, are in people's wallets. No one has tried to sell them. That was just an experience and a way of preserving a memory. Um, but interestingly, the people behind the Beeple sale were proposing that they were going to put together a museum of the 5,000 days and that they wanted people to buy tickets to go see the museum of the 5,000 days, even though people had been publishing these images one a day um, for uh, 12 years for free on the internet, right? So there's a bit of a question mark here. And that around that same time, there was a, an NFT by Hakatao registered for loan on our uh, Vastari exhibition platform. So that's why we started paying attention as well. Um, so museums started minting their own NFTs officially around this time, but they wanted to make it clear that it wasn't an NFT of the actual physical object. So what did they do? Um, the Hermitage in uh, Russia was uh, minted on the Binance blockchain. What they did to make it clear this is not the original Leonardo da Vinci is the 
even the, uh, the the museum director signed it and dated it on the image to kind of give an idea like this is not the Da Vinci itself. It's actually the museum director who has authorized this. And they also sold one, uh, one copy of two. And the second copy, uh, the, the first copy was stored in the Hermitage. So it kind of made it a little bit more clear why, uh, what this was. It made quite a lot of money. Um, then, I don't know how many of you have come across La Colección. They're an organization that mints NFTs of works in museum collections. They did something with the British Museum uh, for their Hokusai exhibition as one of the first things that they did, which also caused a lot of people to question what was the point, because the Hokusai images are prints themselves. So what are these digital editions? Some of them were super rare, some of them weren't. Um, in my opinion, because there was no added metadata or information, I feel like these are kind of digital postcards. But then why would you be paying thousands and thousands for digital postcards? I don't know. So it was a bit confusing, but um, still very interesting how things were evolving. And La Collection continues to do really innovative, interesting things with nonprofit institutions. Um, around that time, we also, uh, so Vastari advised one NFT project on what was then called Heket Nunk. I don't know how many of you have been given that context of a, a, a marketplace that was on the um, on the Tezos blockchain at the time. Uh, the Whitworth is having an exhibition later this year called Economics of Blockbuster, and they minted a piece by William Blake. But instead of that, also to make it clear that the um, the piece was a digital version rather than the physical object. They minted a multi-spectral image of the work rather than the physical, like uh, like rather than a JPEG of the image, just so that people knew they were collecting a digital edition. Um, and then that piece, um, any proceeds would go to benefit causes near the Manchester, uh, near the Whitworth in Manchester. So they kind of did it as a, as a as a fundraising exercise to kind of try and see if they could redistribute the wealth of the Whitworth collection to people uh, in their neighborhood. Um, then um, what else happened? Oh yeah, the Uffizi got a lot of headlines for selling NFTs. What they said was selling NFTs, but really it was a bit different to what people were saying because they were selling NFTs alongside these things, which you can see here at UNIT, which are screens with exact replicas of the works in the museums. Um, so you're actually buying a physical object, which is this screen with one of the pieces from the museum, with an NFT to certify that it is an original copy from the Uffizi. So a lot of people thought that people were buying NFTs just to have the NFT on their wallet, but really the NFT in their wallet just signified that they had an authentic, real copy from the Uffizi of that, whatever it might be, uh, artwork. So yeah, kind of context is key here in understanding what the point was of these museum NFTs. Um, and then there were a lot of museums kind of talking about it, doing um, doing kind of, uh, what's it called, uh, panel discussions about NFTs, a lot of, um, curators and conservators who have been involved with new media art also reminding people that digital art is not a new thing and that it actually has been around for a long time um and even the moma if you look uh this is a screenshot from quite a while ago but they were hiring a web3 associate just for one year to help figure out the web3 space and what they should be doing um, so it was kind of interesting. They kind of figured out that this was something important, but didn't quite know how to handle it. And we're trying to make it all work. So um, that was a bit of my context. What I what, what I guess this presentation was trying to make you perhaps think about or start a bit of a discussion about is this relationship between the physical and the digital. And the way I sometimes talk about it is like the difference between digital art versus digitized art. So what is a digital artwork that is representing a physical object versus what is an actually truly digital artwork? And I know with art, your artistic practice, you might also have images that you create solely to be a digital artwork or pieces that are a digitization of something that was physical. And that relationship between the two is really interesting. Um, another anecdote, I uh, purchased an NFT from a, a great series that was set up by a, a, a duo called Operator, 
that um, is an artistic duo. I own that NFT. Then they created a physical version of that artwork um, that was displayed at a museum. And those physical versions of that artwork were then owned by the museum. So my NFT, a physical version of it, is now in a museum collection. That probably adds to the value of my NFT, but there's no linkage. There's no way that I would have known that unless I was following operator on Twitter and like like I do. I, I really am super interested in what they're doing. So I think there's just so much more that we need to log on this blockchain than just the ownership history and a bit of metadata about the what the object is. And I think that there will be more added context needed in order for this to keep evolving and that we don't have a bit of a treachery of images. And so what I would advocate for all of you for those artworks of yours that will be in museums one day is that you make sure that there is clear documentation about how you think about your artworks. What, what is it? How, how should a collector interact with it? Um, how should it be displayed? Where do you want it to be displayed? Do you have places where it wouldn't, shouldn't be displayed? Uh, for example, uh, a, a friend of mine who's an artist called Robbie Barrett, he told me I would never want any of my artworks to be displayed within a white virtual reality cube. Um, I just think that's horrible and it kills my artwork and I don't want it to be seen in that way. So I just think that those are the types of things that we need to document and save and know how you think about your artworks and how you want to display them just for the museums of the future. Um, so that's a bit of my talk. And this is uh, the last seven minutes, I guess, we can spend talking about how you guys think about this, right? How do you think of the relationship between your physical and digital works? And did you already come across this problem and kind of think about how you would solve it? And feel free to unmute yourself or talk in the chat about how you think about it. Wow, that was amazing, Bernadine. Um, hi, it's Sarah here from Australia. Um, just really quickly, because I know you haven't got very long, um, I'm absolutely fascinated um, about what you were just saying the whole way through, but particularly in that last um, comment about how we'd like our phys uh, digital phys art to be displayed physically. Um, we're actually filmmakers um, uh, creating NFTs. Um, we've had our IMAX films played all around the world, including um, MONA, the Museum of Old and New Art in Hobart, which is an extraordinary space. Um, and we've also exhibited in Art Basel Miami and NFT Liverpool and Stratosphere in Beijing and um, NFT NYC. And the biggest issue for us is um, how the pieces are going to be displayed because we um, typically shoot landscape. Um, and often when we're asked to submit works in open calls, we don't know if they're going to be submitted landscape or portrait. Um, and obviously, if you take a landscape image, especially if it's a film and we shoot from the air, so moving images, um, if curators just arbitrarily, you know, crop the image, um, then it really, you know, just screws up with the nuance um, to us. Completely. So, yeah, so um, I've kind of made a real thing. We've been in the space since early 21. And so I've kind of made a thing of, and I've shared with the um, friends of ours in, in the group here, um, that uh, open calls are brilliant and exhibiting physically is fantastic. But, um, it, and it's gotten better that curators now seem to be much more, you know, comfortable saying to we artists at the front end, you must exhibit um, in portrait or you need to supply a square image um, yeah. or a square scene. And um, so, no, I completely understand what you were saying in your last comments. And um, I won't burble on. Um, it was gorgeous to hear that you're a mentor as well. And um, so many things I could talk about. So I won't yeah. hold the floor. Thanks, Bernadine. Awesome. No, that's super interesting to say. And I completely agree. I kind of, my heart dies inside a little bit whenever I see um, exhibitions where artworks are shown on the same screen. All the artworks are shown on the exact same screen throughout. And that's kind of a trend with NFT shows that you kind of have the same screen. I know it's sometimes practical, right? Like you have to, you have certain screens you have, and that's how you have to show the artwork. But I do think that it's really important for artworks to be um, shown in the way that you want it to. Um, 
and for now while you're around then maybe people will reach out on twitter and ask like how should this be displayed etc but yeah kind of legacy planning and how does that work it's been uh, a big thing um and 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 also uh oh my gosh on untitled puzzle they put my horizontal work on a physical screen exactly i just i just cannot understand that um yeah, I, I think that there's a big issue there. So um, with my current job, actually, speaking of Art Basel, I'm working with um, to kind of it's sort of like NFTs. They're not NFTs because they're not on a public blockchain. It's a private blockchain that has information in NFT like format about physical artworks so that you can basically show add that documentation about how the artwork should be displayed, what it is, et cetera. So if any of you guys are doing physical work as well, then feel free to chat with um, the team at Arcule. Um, they might be able to help you with some of that. Um, um, I like Dave's comment about the donating an AR piece to a museum and whether it should be minted or not. Um, it's really interesting. I I think there is a value in minting it if the institution has a crypto wallet. So one of the things that happened with the Whitworth NFT when we were working on it was that the Whitworth is part of the University of Manchester and the University of Manchester was not open to having a uh, crypto wallet. So then technically your ownership is not transferring into the wallet of the institution. So then how do you make it clear that that is the ownership so i think it depends on whether that institution has a collecting practice and understands how to how to collect that work and you could potentially also think about putting it on a ledger or some kind of hardware device that's what we ended up doing with the whitworth is that uh we created a uh a, 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 what they call a paper wallet for that nft that was then in the vaults at the museum so that they could process it with their old school archaic ways of working um so what are some interesting ways you've seen artists displaying digital artworks on non-screens Ooh, i really like that question um so i think my automatic reaction is thinking about like image mapping and how there are artists working well like for example olaf or elias on randy works with amazing artworks that are prisms that use lenses and lights and all kinds of things to create uh effects and um that's really amazing uh i think that uh, projections are really interesting as well in terms of uh using projectors but again you should be explicit about how you want that to be uh handled um i the, the the place that like the, the new frontier that I think is really interesting is this virtual space, right? Because you've got places um, where you can kind of show digital artworks online in a virtual gallery. Really, that's another place where we have to define how do you feel comfortable having your artwork shown? Would you be open, for example, for your artwork to be imported into like a Sims like home and put hung over the sofa? Or is it that you would want to have it inside of a black void so that it's visible in a certain way? Or is it an augmented reality work that you needed to um, be seen in physical form? So it's kind of like a projection. I think there's lots of different ways that that can be can be done. Um, yeah. So I I I um yeah my session is not very much of an answer giving one it's more of a question giving one with some context from the questions that we were asking ourselves and i think that a lot of the um museums we talked to decided not to do nft projects because they realized they themselves did not have clarity on how they looked at their digital assets they actually um even what i said about that jpeg of the sesines pam pap peep um they didn't think of that digital image as an archaic asset, right? And 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 it's true that image is going to be obsolete one day. They have digital images from 2005 that are now teeny, teeny, tiny that you wouldn't be able to put into a virtual reality space. 
So these digital images we take of the artworks are not the artwork. And a lot of museums were still using that kind of signifier that the digital image of the artwork or the digitized image of the artwork is the artwork. And it really isn't. And I think that that's one of the things that is so important to bear in mind is that that digitized version of your artwork isn't an artwork. Is it a representation of your artwork? Or is it a uh, like a, a poster of your artwork, a postcard of your artwork? Um, that's what I would invite you to think about and think about when you're in your practice about how you're minting your NFTs, etc. Cool. And uh, I'm glad that you guys enjoyed this talk. Uh, I, I, I look forward to seeing uh, what you guys produce and how it goes in the second half of your course. And uh, thanks for the time. I'm, I, and thanks for the reactions, because uh, everything you're saying in the chat, etc. I'm glad that you appreciated my, my chat. And uh, I look, uh, please, as I said, feel free to reach out through Twitter. My handle is the same as my Discord handle. Um, on Instagram, it's the same handle as well. Uh, and my team at Arcule is also very interested in talking to artists. At the moment, we only work with artists that are working with a gallery. So uh, that is because every NFT that's minted on the private blockchain has to have two signatories. So you have to have because they represent a physical object, they have to have a counter signatory that attests that that physical object exists, which currently is a gallery. So if any of you work with a gallery for your physical objects, feel free to talk to us about RQ as well. All right, I'm running away now, but thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful uh, early morning to those in Australia and uh, also uh, evening or morning wherever you are. Um, see you later, guys. Yeah. <laughs>